change their minds about that. I, I would like to throw in my two cents worth of this with an anecdote about Rachmaninoff. <clears throat> Rachmaninoff uh, apparently decided how he was going to play everything he played. And once he decided on the way he was going to play it, and then he played it that way the rest of his life. Now, there are people who rave about the re recordings of Rachmaninoff, but they're spoiled for me once I heard this story. Because you can hear this. You can actually hear the calculation in this. It's, it's, it's totally lifeless playing, I think, uh, to judge from, and, and, you know. I remember having a lesson uh, when I was in undergraduate school with my teacher, Roy McAllister, and we, this topic came up, and he said, well, there are people who work for continuity of line and people who work for spontaneity of line. And I think that's a, a distinction worth remembering. Uh, I'd like to invite the members of the audience to ask questions of specific panel members, if you like, because we, we represent quite a variety of things up here. Yes? Um, I'd like to ask Mark, going back to um, medium, um, how important do you feel it is with a graphic work such as a medium for the audience to see and know the score? Do you think that's important um, for their understanding of what's going on between page and sound? The, qu the question was about it, whether the to what extent it's important for the audience to see the score. Um, I evidently didn't think that was important because that, in that particular piece, because it was composed for a, a commission um, for the Quiet Music Ensemble in a festival, a music, a music festival in Cork, Ireland, and it, as an afterthought, we put some pages up um, at intermission on music stands or after the concert for audience goers to, to look at. So, but there was no prior, there was no prior plan made by me or the ensemble. Um, so, so the answer was no in that case. Now, in retrospect, since I've continued to pursue things that we call, you know, like, or these kind of eccentric sorts of scores, now I feel like people uh, ought to, should not be deprived of seeing them. But um, that wasn't important to me, actually. Yes, Matt. Uh, something that uh, you don't think Dixon said to me once, um, where he said, Notation is how you take how you walk into the room, and notation is how you take your trumpet out of your case. Uh, and I was wondering if you're talking about notation as a, as a means of transmitting information from a composer to a performer, how do you take into account the role of band leader, music director, sort of how does the personality of the composer in a very active present sense inform your guys' sense of notation? Who are you asking this on? Any one of them. I mean, Any one how, how the role, how the role, the, the difference between being a composer and a band leader is simply a means of non traditional notation. I don't get the question. <laughs> <laughs> Panelist, uh, anybody want to respond to this? I was thinking about the, the question was more around the idea, I think in one of the challenges of, for me, the interests of the sort of improvising music spectrum is blending the identity of composer, band leader, and performer. And I think how the role of an active band leader as an, uh, transmitting musical ideas changes the relationship to notation. Does that make sense? If I understand it, this, this would mean the band leader is part of the score. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's what I'm working with in the, in the score that I'm making right now, because I need the I need the conductor to be able to coordinate three different streams, uh, of, you know, three very different uh, streams of, of musical information. And so it, this this is a different a different kind of conducting. It's not it's not beating time or it's not. Uh, Necessarily shaping the music either, but it's it's coordinating in an, in another kind of way, and also uh, giving uh, giving feedback to the performers as they go along uh, in a uh, an encouraging way. One thing. So yeah, I think it's a, a, a good question and it's something that could be thought about. Uh, deeply and, and, and uh, 
uh, maybe changing some of the ways that uh, we go about directing this. Just to tag on, for me there's a confusion between being the performer okay, and being the composer or being both in that uh, it is absolutely the case. I mean, and I certainly will do this with people when we're trying to do pieces. Talk about posture, okay? Talk about performing the act of listening, that your listening helps somebody in the audience listen, right? And that focus of attention in that way. And I remember a workshop on sonic meditations in 001 with Nathan Shibabuku and Pauline Oliveros doing the meditation where you pass a hand squeeze with a ah! Okay, and they're like, uh, 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 uh. and Pauline was about 10 times faster than anybody else. And that taught them everything they needed to know about how much harder they had to work to get these meditations from. Okay, so, so the, you know, there, there are, but that strikes me as being performative more than it's compositional, right? So I don't quite get that. I can imagine, it sort of sounds a little bit like the Miles Davis thing of, okay, here's the electric piano, Herbie. I mean, that there are ways in which you can act as a compositional force as a band leader with improvisers that you're working with, you know, in, in, on that, in, in that manner. But that's, and yes, and that's persona, and that's maybe performing persona even, uh, but that seems to be within um, a really specific community of people who, who are, who you're already working with. So it, it, it seems that the blur it's hard, to, it's hard for me to bring that back to, um, it, and maybe that's another, this is back to who the notation is for, right? But yeah, that's totally notational, but it's not for a general public, right? Because it, usually those aren't. Those are really for, it's what's interesting about Cobra is it leaked out and became folk music, even though that isn't really what it was supposed to be, right? You know, so it, it, it leaked out, so many people did it, 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 it becomes it become something else. It's the closest we have to Brahms in the 25th century. Uh, Mark, did you have a, a, a question or comment? Uh, well, something just occurred to me, uh, which uh, was touched on very briefly uh, with the shift from analog to digital uh, that Christian was talking about. Um, do you find that there, the culture of the people that play your music uh, has really shifted over time and has that affected the way you even think about putting your pieces together and knowing that, that there's a cultural shift in a sense among the people that are going to be uh, putting it up? Uh, I believe that's a question for Christian. Well, no, it could be for anyone, really. It's a question of if you use a harpsichord to play Bach, right? As opposed to a piano. Um, yeah, I don't know quite how to respond. The, it makes me think of how often, in, especially in the early electronic pieces, which were analog, um, the younger people will not come in with their computers and do them on the computer. And that, I think, is pretty wrong. It doesn't work. It's kind of like Alvin is. Uh, I'm sitting in a room. There are versions now which they worked out on the computer and they do it that way. And it just doesn't work. It's not convincing. Uh, maybe they can get good advice. As I say, their, their performances are bought on the piano that are, can be persuasive. I don't know that. But still, you have to really do it very carefully and think about where that music is coming from and how it relates to this new technology. You know, Matthew McDonald was talking about really this, this issue because the Ives 114 songs is the analog version and the Hitchcock edition is the digital version. Literally, this is true. Yes. So I'm just going back to the audio graphics and being able to see them when the music's being performed. Um, so it's on a lot of the stuff on the big screen. Um, do you not find the audience, as it was said in the previous session, you can't truly listen um, and see at the same time? can't see it here at the same time. So do you not think that the audience are also then playing the game, trying to spot the performer, perform a certain graphic, and therefore they're not listening? And so my question to Mark is, is that part of what you want? Would you rather people just listen? And my question maybe to, to Paulie or Paula, or to Ron, actually, <coughs> would be, do they want people to know the instructions of their pieces? Do they want them to be in the broad programs, or do they want them just to listen to them as music? So they Mark them. So um, I'm I'm actually really bored with music, and uh, and the specific part or the specific subset of music that bores me is sound. So um, so I'm all in favor of visual paradigms. Um, 
to not only, uh, in a sense, accompany or mimic or parallel or partner with the sounds, but to distract me and to um, give me a certain kind of, um, I don't, yeah, so I, I think it's a panacea of sorts to actually have these, have, I, I think I'm a maximalist, so I'm, I'm interested in like more things that I can, uh, other portals through which I can access. Uh, God, I can't believe I just said that to some people who care so deeply about preparing my piece and the sound of my piece. I mean, it's kind of a cavalier response. I do care about the sound, but uh, I'm delighted to be distracted from the other things. The cat is out of the bed. Uh, other responses to that extraordinary. Paul. Um, I think for the, the for the process for the, the piece uh, for in words of one syllable, like it's it's I, I, people really don't need to see the score at all. Like, I think it's because there's such a simple action that's set up for it that there's a certain transparency there, and that the the score really functions purely as a mnemonic device. Um, I, and uh, I like that you, that you guys refer to it as a crib sheet. <laughs> I was uh, you know and seeing how that then it really becomes a question of layering and how that sort of how that sort of interaction takes place over time. Specifically, I like that. Like, what happens in the piece is that they choose tempos for each other, and so like having that sort of as being this kind of additional tension and sort of surprise within that, I think, is something that. Not sorry if that was like a spoiler alert, but um, yeah, it's something that. Um, yes, we have time for one more question. Oh, boy. Alex, you're it. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I, I'm really interested in this question. Um, you know, the, the, the word spontaneity came up, and and, and one of the things that. Um, having just performed Rebecca Saunders' work last night, uh, that was really present for me was, was this question of the fact that there's not usually enough time, at least in New York, to like, really work on a piece. And certainly, this question of being, um, as a performer, being the first reader of something and really relying upon the listener to complete that reading or that listening, you know, that the, the brain pan of the observer is so important in order to complete the performance. Um, so this question of spontaneity for, for me seems, seems to be a little bit, there's, there's a lot of anxiety around that. And the thing that actually I have the most anxiety about is this question of where what's happening to memory. I think this relates to Christian's um, comments about, about the analog. And, and, and it came up in the, in the first paper about uh, uh, Kirkpatrick. John Kirkpatrick, yes. Uh, copying out by hand, and this is something, I, I mean, that's how I learned. I mean, I, I was always told to copy every score out by hand. And, you know, you put it in your own hand first, and then, you know, you, you play it. And um, so my question is, you know, the, what's, in terms of where notation is going, in terms of what, um, what its goals are for, let's say, for the performer or for an audience, um, how do, and this is really a broad question, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of looking at Christian, but, I, but this is really for everybody. Um, how are you thinking about uh, the future of, 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 of the process of, of memory in relationship to a score? In, in other words, you know, if, if, we look, if we look back at, at various performances, if we, if we look back at various editions, which are essentially copied, copies of copies, and, and that you know, each time it renders a new score. How are we thinking in terms of what scores are doing for a, new, for a future uh, type of memory, for, for the future performer that may or may not have the kind of memory that is it, required for these pieces or, you know. Well, actually, the makes it, we have recordings. Yeah. Which totally short-circuits that question. Uh, I, I think recording, I, our recording is so totally different from, from the score. I, I, I claim the privilege of the chair. They're just a we, version, right? Because, because we are now over. Oh, okay. uh, we are now <laughs> over our allotted five minutes. And also, your question, which is so fascinating, throws, that is, that it, the memory has not been mentioned before, I, I believe, in this conference. And of course, the whole purpose of notation is memory yeah. from the very beginning. So, thank you, Alex, for bringing us back to the beginnings of this whole thing. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we have wonderful events uh, later on. Stick around. Thank you.